Well, Merry Christmas, and thank you so much for spending part of your Christmas with us. I love this time of year. It's just so magical. I've got two little boys, and, and so just seeing the magic on their faces, it's, it's just great. It reminds me, it, it sends me back to a time when, when I was little, and I remember that Christmas season would come, and, and my mom could play some on the piano, and I would go over, and she would play the piano, and we would sing Silent Night together. And then she'd get me hot chocolate, which I think I liked more than singing Silent Night together. And we could eat Christmas cookies, and we would hear all kinds of stories, and, and we would just, we'd just have a great time together as a family. And there was just something about having all the Christmas trees up at home, and it made me feel just so warm and so safe and so at peace. And I know that we live in a chaotic world, and sometimes as you get a little bit older, you realize how much some of those things can be a facade, and, and how you just cling to those things, which, which make you feel that way a lot of times. And I know that a lot of people would just, would just pray and hope for, for peace on earth, and, and when they sing songs like Silent Night, they long for a difference in the world in which we live, maybe even long for a difference in the life in which you live. Maybe you've gone through some circumstances this past year that have been really hard and really difficult, and they're just heartbreaking. And you're here today, and we're so glad that you're here today, and you're here with a smile on your face because you're faking it for your family, because you don't want them you don't want them to know all the pain that you're going through, and you don't want them to know that it's only Christmas Eve and they're already driving you crazy, and you still got a whole nother day or maybe even a couple of days to get through, and you're like, I'll oh, just make this end really quickly, please. But wherever you find yourself, thank you for being here. Merry Christmas. I remember the first Christmas that my wife and I spent together when we were engaged. I was living in Mississippi at the time, and she was finishing grad school in Ohio, and so I came, I came home, and it was our first Christmas together when we were engaged, and so we had to hit every family's house. We had to do four Christmases on Christmas Day, never mind the fact we had to do two Christmases the day before that on Christmas Eve, so six Christmases between the two days. It was a nightmare. It was a disaster. You would hurry up. You would go to one place. They would talk to you. Oh, stay, stay. We haven't even started eating yet. And then you would eat a little bit there, and then you would leave, and they'd be like, well, thanks for dropping by. And you're like, I've got four, three other places to be at. You're welcome. And so there's just a little bit of that going on. Then we get to the next place, and oh, aren't you hungry? No, not really. Well, eat, eat, sit down, eat. It'll be fun. It'll be great. All right, fantastic. Not to be rude, but we really need to get this show on the road. So if we could open up presents and then peace out, that would be fantastic. Thanks so much. We've just got other places to be. It's not that we don't love you, but I mean, really, there's, there's only so many hours in the day. And be like, oh, well, I see you just came for the presents. Yeah, kind of, but you know, no. Merry, Merry Christmas. We love you so much, Nana. Uh, great. Great to, great to see you again. And then it's on and on and on. And I've, I've never understood why we had so much ham. I mean, Jesus was Jewish, and we had ham at every single place. And I hate ham. In every single place, we're celebrating the birth of Jesus with ham. I'm like, this is so, so counterproductive. It's just wrong on so many different levels. And just the stress of that. After the day, I looked at my, I looked at my fiance at the time, now my wife, and I said, we're never doing that again. That was absolutely miserable. And my wife, who is much kinder than I am, and a much sweeter and gentler soul, looked at me and said, you're right. We, we, can't, we can't do that again, ever. And so, I don't know, maybe you find yourself in a position like that today where you're dreading tomorrow because of all the times that you're going to have to spend and all the houses that you're going to have to go to and, and all of that. Or maybe you've already been through the whirlwind this weekend and today and you're just like, oh, I just want to rest. I've had enough. Or whether right now things are going great for you and life is at, at an all-time high and, and you don't have to fake the smile because everything is, you finally got some synergy in your life, and everything is moving comfortably, and it's going really well, and you're excited, and, and for the first time, and really maybe as long as you can remember, you, you don't ha really have a worry in the world. Everything is going great, and you are on a, a mountaintop right now. And, and so wherever you find yourself, thank you so much for being here. Merry Christmas. Thanks for spending part of your time with us. And this, this afternoon, we're going to look back and we're going to see one of the events of the birth of Jesus that, that isn't talked about all that much, 
But if you are here and you're going through a hard time and you're experiencing the craziness of the season and the craziness of this world, I want you to understand that God understands what you're going through. God understands and he can relate. You see, around the time that Jesus was born, it was a very politically volatile situation in the region in which he was born. There was a king named King Herod who was ruling And yet there were all these different factions who were vying for power. And Herod would have to do just enough to keep everybody okay. Nobody was really that excited about it. But he had to do just enough to keep everyone okay so that he could remain in power. And this is where he finds himself. And all of a sudden, there's the birth of Jesus. And in this politically volatile situation, now these these wise men come. And they are introduced to King Herod. And they've come from the Orient. They've come from the eastern part of the world. And what has drawn them to this region is a star. It's a bright star. And it's it's a star that they've been waiting for due to prophecy. And they understand that the king of the Jews has been born. Now Herod hears this and he's outraged. Because he's the king. And he, like all people in, in in political roles do, wants to retain his power. More so than anything else, he wants to make sure that he does enough so that he can stay in charge and he can stay in power. And so when he hears that the king of the Jews has been born, he's nervous. He's nervous that his grip on the kingdom is going to be taken from him. He's outraged that somebody else would displace him and be in charge. And when he hears that these wise men are looking for the king, he has to put together a plan. And so if you have your Bible apps on your phones or your tablets, you can follow along with us there. And if you don't, no worries. It'll be on the screens right there. But we're going to look at a book of, named Matthew. And what Matthew is, it's a biography of the life of Jesus. It tells the story of the life of Jesus. And we're going to start there in the second chapter and the seventh verse where we read these words. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And so what we see right here is Herod lies. He develops a plan and he lies to them, hiding his true agenda. But he wants them to think his agenda is one thing, and that's that he can celebrate the birth of Jesus, when in reality, his agenda is to go and to destroy Jesus. That is the agenda that Herod has. And so he lies to the wise men, and he says, when you discover him, when you find where Jesus is, make sure you let me know so that I can come and celebrate just like you're coming and celebrating, so that we can all join hands and sing Kumbaya and be so excited that Jesus has been born, when in reality he wanted to destroy him. And the star continues to guide the wise men on their way after their meeting with Herod. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. And so the wise men finally, after following this star, after journeying from another part of the world, they finally get to encounter Jesus. And when they do, they fall down and they worship him. This is the result of their journey. They had, it wasn't an easy journey. It wasn't instantaneous. And some of you can relate because your journey with God hasn't been easy and it hasn't been instantaneous. And it has taken you through places and things in life that you never thought you would have to go through. It has taken you through experiences that you never saw coming. It has, it has taken you through some of the fiercest and darkest valleys that you have ever had to endure. And yet you have fully discovered it. And maybe for some of you, you're not there yet. 
Maybe for some of you, you know that there's something out there, but you haven't yet been able to put your finger on it. You haven't decided for yourself what the answer is. You know in your heart that there's something bigger than you. You know in your heart that there's something bigger than all of this, and yet you can't yet fully grasp what that is. And so you are still on your journey. And the question that I want to ask you is, what is your response to God? What is your response to God? Is it one of worship? Is it one of surrender? Is it of a desire to follow after Him? Or is it entirely different? Is it angst? Is it fear because you know that you and God need to do some business? And, and you're okay right now, but there's angst in your heart. Because you've never come to terms with who God is and what he means to you. And you, you put up a really nice facade and you don't let anybody know that what's going on, the inner turmoil, the war that you are within yourself. And oftentimes this is true of the most religious people ever who, who have the appearance like they have it all together. But in their heart there's nothing but angst when they think about God because they haven't yet come to peace with who he is and what he's done for them. Is it anger? Are you here begrudgingly for your wife or your kids or for your husband or for your parents? But really, this is the last place in the world that you want to be. And you'll be here today because it's Christmas and you'll do the thing because family's a really big value to you. But there is no place that you would rather be less than right here, right now. And truth be told, you are angry and you are bitter. And God has failed you in your mind. And there is something that happened along the way where God, you just completely lost interest in God. And you said to yourself, if God was real, or if God loved me, or if God cared, if, if God was real, why wouldn't he intervene? Why wouldn't he do something? If God loved me, why did I have to go through this? And there is anger within you. Is that your encounter? Or is it disappointment? Life has dealt you something you didn't sign up for. And truth be told, you right now just walk through life disappointed you're not angry you're just giving up and you're just disappointed as you walk through life the question i have for you is is, is simply this what is your response to god because we all need one what is yours for the wise men they gave gifts they gave gifts this is symbols of their worship. They fell and they gave their gifts. And let me just encourage you. God wants you. God wants you. He desperately desires a relationship with you. God wants to be a part of your life. God wants to work. God wants to reign in your life. God desperately wants you. You are incredibly valuable to God. And you might not even believe that yourself right now. There might be so much hurt and heartache and regret that's in your life. You have been told by so many people. Maybe it was a parent. Maybe it was a teacher. Maybe it was both. You've been told by so many people. Maybe it was a lover. I don't know. But you've been told by so many people that you are nothing and you have no worth and you have no value. And the only value that you provide in this world is what you can provide for them in a moment or in an instant. And any time that you exist and you don't do that, you are just reminded that you are worthless and you're not good enough and you will never, ever measure up. And I want you to know that nothing could be further from the truth. There is a God who desperately loves you, who desires a relationship with you at your core, who designed you with unique gifts, who designed you with unique abilities, and who loves you more than you can ever imagine. And so if you have been beaten down, if you've been discouraged, if you've been broken, if you've been told that you're not good enough, if the people that you have loved have hurt you the most with their words and with their anger, and you started to believe that lie i'm begging you to give yourself a gift today and to understand that not only is there a god but there's a god who's absolutely crazy about you there's a god who loves you dearly and who loves every part of you just 
as you are. And it doesn't mean that God doesn't want better for you. And so it doesn't mean that God doesn't want you to change, but he loves you as you are and desires you right now. And when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, rise, take that child and his mother and flee to Egypt. And remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet out of Egypt. I called my son. And so put yourself in the shoes of Joseph and put yourself in the shoes of Mary. They're the first time parents, first time as a father, first time as a mother. This is where you just really understand. You get that you have to protect your child. The cold realities of this world, they come storming in. There's no time to rest. You are faced with it right away. And you go into protection mode where all of a sudden you really discover that you will do anything. You will do anything to protect that child, no matter what it takes. And they are sprung into this role right away. And if you've ever been a parent, you've had one of these moments where you just something within you that you didn't even know was possible before you had kids. There is just a whole nother level when you see your kid in danger. I mean, you would be able to lift things you could never lift before. You will scream and sound more demonic than you've ever screamed before. You will, you will fight anybody, and it doesn't even matter if they're right. You will just take them on, and you will win because you've got the rage of a parent that's going on. And this comes into, this comes into play for Joseph and Mary as they're told, you've got to get Jesus out of here. Now, parents, let me talk to you just for, just for a minute because Christmas is such a special time for our kids. Christmas is so, so special. It's so magical to see the look in their eyes. It's just, it's, it's so heartwarming when, when you have a kid. Christmas is special for everyone, but, but especially when you have kids. And so parents, I, I just, I understand we can put so much pressure on ourselves to try to please everyone else. And we can do everything for our kids. We can, we can provide for them everything. And, and if we're not careful, what can happen is, is we can miss so much joy because we're constantly worried that we haven't done enough. We can lose so much joy because we find ourselves engaged in the comparison game. And rather than just worry about the things that, that we can worry about, we're constantly worried that we haven't done enough, that, that somebody else has done more, and we, we, can, we can play the comparison game, and then all of the joy is taken away from us, and we lose sight of it. So I just, I just want to challenge you to, to not lose sight of that to keep the joy, to understand what's really important and what really matters, to take the time to enjoy the season, to take the time to enjoy your kids, to not worry about what anybody else is doing, to do your best and understand that that's enough. Take care of your kids' needs and understand it's okay not to be able to give them everything that they want. You provide for their needs. That's your responsibility as a parent provide for their needs, and, and certainly this is prevalent at other times other than Christmas, but especially at the Christmas time, it can, be, it can become just such a hassle, and we can put so much unnecessary pressure upon ourselves that we lose sight of all the joy in the process. And so I just want to encourage you, just take the time, enjoy your family, enjoy your kids, understand that you're not going to be able to give your kids everything in the world that they will ever want, and honestly, you shouldn't, because look at the kids that, that get everything in the world that they want. None of them turn out well. They're all like a 60-minute reality show, and then you sit and you watch, and, and it's a Dateline special, or you can see segments of it in an airport. It never ends well. All right, so don't fret about the fact that you can't give your kids everything they want. Just make sure you're taking care of their needs and do your best. Just an aside for your parents, make sure that you enjoy Christmas. Now, Herod, he discovers in this process that Joseph and Mary and Jesus, they've hightailed it out to Egypt. They're gone. He discovers that, that he's been tricked because the wise men, they take another route out. And so Herod begins massacring the children who are two and under. Because when he didn't get what he wanted, he just went into a rage and he tried to take it by force. 
Then we pick up the story in verse 19. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the child's life are dead. And so Joseph, Mary, and Jesus who were refugees in Egypt, who were on the run, who had to live with that fear, who had to live with that turmoil, now receive word that they can go back to their home region. Because those who sought to kill Jesus were now dead. And yet it's not lost on us that roughly 30 years later, there would be a whole new segment of people who would desire to kill Jesus. This is, after all, why we celebrate Christmas. See, had Jesus just come to this world and and been born, it's a miraculous story, and it's fantastic, but it doesn't change the outcome for us. Jesus had to come with a purpose. He had to come with a mission. Because each of us have a problem. God has a standard. God created us so he gets to make the rules. That's the way it goes. When you create something, you get to make the rules of how it operates. God created us so he gets to make the rules. And God's rules are that we would be perfect. And some of us are are really good. Others, not so much. You won't be getting as many presents tomorrow as a result of that. Maybe a little bit of coal in your stocking would be be a good thing. Uh, But some of us are going to be getting lots of presents tomorrow, and our stockings will be full. Others of us, not so much. But the reality is, it doesn't matter. It's, It's not whether or not we're good enough. That's not God's standard. Because we can't make it. There is no answer of what's good enough. God's standard is perfection. And we all fall short of that standard. Every single one of us. Because of choices that we have made. Because of things that we have done. Because of things that, that we've just, we, we regret. And we, if we could, we'd take them back. But we can't. And, and all of us have those things in our lives. But they mark us. And they change us. And they hurt us. And, and it just changes us at our core a little bit. And so all of us have those things. But they're imperfections. And it doesn't mean that you're a bad person per se. It just means that you're imperfect. And the problem is of what God's standard is. And God's standard is perfection. And so 30 years after Joseph and Mary would discover that Herod was dead, Jesus would discover that there were other people who wanted to kill him. And this time he wouldn't run. This time he wouldn't flee. This time there was no escape plan. Because this time the plan was to die. And in a weird way, this is what we celebrate about Christmas. We celebrate the fact that God loved us enough to come and to join us and to come and to rescue us. But as we celebrate, we have to understand that the ultimate reason that we celebrate is because the birth of Jesus was the first step in leading to the death of Jesus. So that we could be changed. So that we could have hope. So that we could have a relationship with the God who created us that we rebelled against. This time Jesus would not run. This time he would fulfill the reason that he came. And he would die. Because that's the cost of our mistakes. That's the cost of our imperfection. And in God's economy, the death of Jesus, who is innocent, covers my mistakes. The reason we celebrate the birth of Jesus is because he came to die. And yet, as grim as that sounds, there's hope. Because Jesus wasn't simply human. 
Within Jesus is the fully divine and full humanity on display in one. And so Jesus, being God, is greater than death because he is the creator and the author of life. And three days later, after dying upon a cross, after being willing to lay down his life to fulfill the reason that he came, he rose again from the dead, proving that God was bigger than any mistake that we had ever made, proving that God was bigger than any criticism that we will ever face, proving that God was bigger than any doubt or unbelief or anything that we could possibly do, proving that God loved us and desired to have a relationship with each and every one of us. And that is why we celebrate Christmas. We celebrate the fact that Jesus came, but he came to save us and set us free. And this is the gift that is greater than any other gift. And the gift we celebrate this Christmas Eve. God, thank you. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for setting us free. God, I pray for the person here right now who doesn't have hope. I pray for the person here who feels just so empty. And whether they're angry or disappointed or just full of angst, God, I pray that you'd help them see the truth, that your incredible love for them is immense. And I pray, God, that this Christmas would be a time where they receive the greatest gift that has ever been given, and that's to have a relationship with you through what your son Jesus has accomplished on our behalf. God, I pray for the person here who's, who's just... Life is perfect right now, and everything's going great. And I pray, God, that in that perfection, I pray, God, that in this season where, er, where things are so, so good that they wouldn't lose sight of their need for you and what really matters. And, God, I pray for just the person who has no hope. Help them experience hope. Help them experience love and help them experience peace being willing to come to the place where they admit that they have fallen short and there are imperfections in their lives, what the Bible calls sin. And yet, God, that you're bigger than that. So, God, I pray that they would give that to you, understanding that you came, but you came to save us and set us free. That they would place their hope in your son, Jesus. And they would have a relationship with you. Thank you, God, for your love for us. Thank you, God, that we can have peace. Thank you, God, for all that you've done. In your son, Jesus' name we pray.